Good morning. Thank you, Andrew, for this very, very fair, unfair presentation. But uh, I think it's, it's an honor for us to be the first one to present the papers that will be presented during all day. And I think it's an honor to be the one who will be triggering the discussions that we'll have in the following presentations. As usual, we have to show our disclosure of interest. Uh, I have been invited speakers for many, many enterprises, public and private in Brazil and all over the world. But I do not have any bond sharing or participation in any of these industries. Uh, and I do, do not in declare them that they do not interfere in my presentations. Uh, we are talking today about a very, very ancient product, a very ancient food that just recently was rediscovered in the modern world. Uh, as you see, we'll try to present this food in history, some of the health benefits that arrived during the presentation of this uh, very long road that we had put together, some possible definitions that we derive from them, the tendencies for the future, and a very short Brazilian case study. This will be only an introduction of yogurt. Yogurt in history uh, is a very interesting product because it's a very, very old one. And it has many, many names. Uh, we stick with the name yogurt without age. The age usually appears in Europe. Uh, but usually in the papers, in the literature, you see yogurt like it's written in the American way. But around the world, we have a lot, a lot of different uh, possibilities of names, from the name uh, called in Armenia, in India, in Egypt. All of them are very different. And I think the most interesting ones are in Arabic ones, because it calls uh, Levin or Lavan, that's uh, the name for white product, or, or the, it's the, name, the same name that we have in Hebrew and other languages. Uh, but in Russia and in Japan, we use the term Matsoni, and in some countries, we have the alliteration of the product of yogurt called Yogurti. But all of them are very similar and very, very, very uh, modifications of the, the same product, so we can come forward. Uh, where comes this word? Uh, the words uh, come usually from one very specific kind of food. And this word comes from the old, old very old Turkish strain. It's called yogurt, to name to thicken, to curdle, and so the majority of this, these names that are associated with yogurt has the same properties. But as you see, we have to associate yogurt with the history of uh, the humankind, and we associate that with the origin of the dairy in, in the human food in the, in the human food history also. Is we go to a timeline, it's very difficult to see that, but we understand that probably the name yogurt or the products that arrive from yogurt has arrived from, from 10,000 before Christ to 5,000 before Christ together with the domestication of some animals to produce milk. Usually goat, but in some places cows, in some places uh, and other mares and other products that uh, arise from milk. Uh, milk was very difficult to be used because it was sourced very easily. So we don't know if by accident or by purpose, uh, some of the nomads that were carrying milk around from one place to another, they carried this milk in some bags made of intestinal gut skin of gut, and with the fermentation that appears together from carrying this milk inside these, these bags, we had a product that is sour, but it was tasty, and it could be used for a long, long time. 
After that, uh, we had some dissemination all over some regions, especially in India and Asia, especially the regions that are now associated with the Russian Empire. Uh, we know that many of these armies and some populations associated the use of this product with some health benefits, and almost all of them were related to gastrointestinal diseases, especially in children, in very small children, uh, after breastfeeding or uh, after weaning products. Uh, it was also used in some countries as a cleaning product. It's interesting because uh, usually it was also as a cleanse to, to take out some species of problems that you had in your skin so you can use, like it was used in milk for a very rich population, that when they uh, were bathing in milk, they were using yogurt to clean the old skin that you have in your face. But it was only in the Roman Empire that Pliny, the elder, uh, the famous historian, uh, was the first one to write something about yogurt in, in paper that we have knowledge. So after that, the mentions that the barbarians uh, used yogurt as a healthy product and it has many benefits. It was very well known in the Greek and the Roman Empire. But uh, almost as uh, a mill millennia appear after that, and during especially this very, very long time, this product was used only in some countries, especially in Asia, in some parts of the Caucasus, uh, so it's very unknown to m the majority of the countries in the Western population. But wars appeared at the time, and some of the alliances that were very interesting around the story made that the, some Spanish armies, the Turkish armies, were allied in some of the wars, and so in the 16th century, uh, some of the soldiers of Spain and some of the soldiers in, in the western uh, part of the world used yogurt based on the influence of the Turkish uh, armies at the time. So it was interesting because it was almost uh, a thousand years after the popularization in the Asian regions that the western populations were aware that this product could be useful, especially for the armies, especially when they were facing a lot of diarrheas in the battlefields. Well, uh, but we consider that the modern history of yogurt appears only at the beginning of the 20th century with the studies of a very young medical student, Dr. Grigorov, that was trying to establish why, especially the people in Bulgaria, were healthy and they have very long years of life and they were associated probably with this kind of product, the yogurt at this time, the, the special there that was called Bulgar. And we all know that he was the first one to discover the yogurt bacteria, especially the Streptococcus thermophilus. But only at the beginning of the 20th century with the studies of the Pasteur study, uh, the Pasteur Institute together with the works of the famous Nobel laureate, the Professor Metchnikov, that we knew and we associated yogurt with bacteria and with some very interesting properties like health benefits for a long, long time. At only in the middle of the 30s that Isaac Carasso has the first uh, trial of commercialization of this yogurt in pharmacies as a medicine and running from the, the global war, the Second World War, he arrives in the US and there he amplified his business in order to get some of the most famous history of the food industry around the world. Um, we have the first factory in France in 32, in 41 the first factory in the US, but I would like to go back to Europe and this small factory uh, appears in the 20s, and they are allegedly patented 
the first geography in history. So they have the first commercial patent with this very difficult name that I think that you cannot read and I do not dare to pronounce it because it's very, very difficult for us, but it's called something Mlancarna, so I don't know how to do that. Uh, so we have to understand why an ancient product used as a possible medicine during for many, many, many centuries it started to be utilized as a common food in Europe and US in a short period of time, only a hundred years from medicine to a product that will be used for worldwide. Probably there are some health reasons around it. Probably we have a lot of science behind the food and probably also we had some windows of opportunity, a marketing product that is very interesting because we'll see in a short while why it's so important for us. But most of all, I think the importance of the yogurt is because we have a lot of nutritional knowledge that we will see during the whole day this in this summit. So we, in summary, yogurt in history was an arrangement of essential nutrients containing a highly bioavailable matrix used daily with very strong acceptance, allowing dairy conservation for large periods. And now, we have uh, some kind of modifications because milk, uh, the yogurt is defined as a milk product with lactose digested with viable and efficient bacteria, very well defined bacteria with name and surname, and it is an essential source for many nutrients, being a very important vehicle for fortification and added things from fruits, from flavors, from vitamins, from minerals, uh, probiotics, and it is highly modified modernly by sweeteners, fruits, flavors, consistency, especially in content of fat and proteins, and especially in aroma and presentations around the world. But as definition, we know that usually it comes from a source of milk. During history, it was derived from goat milk, from many other sheep milk, buffalo, camels, yaks, horse milks, and even uh, what we call soy milk. But usually it's cow milk, the, the original source of that, with uh, the support of beneficial bacteria and the process of fermentation. We have a food that is acidified, is thickened. We have a longer expiration date, usually, that can benefit especially to our human gut. This is very dependent on the quality of milk, and this based on the standardization of the product, and we can have the separation of the cream, and so we can have the use of skilled milk. We have very interesting temperatures. The temperatures are enough and are necessary in order for the bacteria to act in order to modify the properties of the original source of milk. So we set up a fermentation for these two important bacteria. Yogurt is defined by the combination or by the symbiosis of these very well-known bacteria, the, uh, the Streptococcus thermophilus and Lactobacillus bulgaricus, the variant uh, the Brucki, and you know that they must work in a sterile environment in very, very low temperatures, and for fermentation, they must be in the range of 36 to 42 Celsius degrees for three to eight hours, depending on the process, and so we have yogurt. Uh, with this kind of interactions of a very important matrix based on milk, so we can see the interaction of the properties especially of the protein of milk to deriving from these amino acids and especially its proteins together with the action of this bacteria over the urea of the milk and we have as an acidified product that we can see that is the final product of that. And the combination of these bacteria has the most important way of trying to have the most acidified product. So only one bacteria is not enough, so we have to have the combination of them 
to have uh, an acidified product. So what happens about after this fermentation? We have a flavor that's mainly acidic. It, we have an improvement of appearance, taste, and consistency. We have better conservancy, and we have better digestibility. We have a diminution of growth of pathogens. It's beneficial to our human goat and we have a coagulation of these milk proteins, so it will be easier for some of the populations that have some kind of feeling that they have some kind of intolerance of lactose. So what's next? In the future, probably we'll decide that yogurt is beneficial for our health, especially on some characteristics. And some of them is based on the fact that we have many populations around the world that have different levels of lactose intolerance. With the using of dairy products in this population, we have a very important problem. This is the decrease of calcium intake. You have seen recently in the data of the United States showing that almost 54% of adults in the States do not reach the requirements for calcium. In our country, 99% of the adults do not reach the minimum amount of calcium intake this is at least uh, uh, 1,000 milligrams of calcium. And especially for children after the school age, we have the almost 99% of them reaching uh, only 500 or 600 milligrams of calcium. So these properties of yogurt could increase the calcium intake and we have to decide today if we also can see some of the decreasing on morbidities. That so will be the, all the theme of the presentation that will follow myself. When we see the nutrient components of milk, yogurt, and cheese in some of the tables, especially here in the States, we see for calcium that uh, yogurt plain with skim milk is high, has higher content of calcium and it has um, no content on vitamin D if not added. But we can have some modification on that because with some properties of yogurt, uh, this especially related to the fermentation of the bacteria, we have the feeling that we can improve uh, lactose intolerance because it's not very uh, decided, it's not assumed that, that we have a modification on lactose intolerance, but the feeling of lactose intolerance is very important for these people. So they can afford to have much more dairy products than only using milk, and it's not very easy to have them based on cheese in some regions. Uh, but yogurt has very strong possibilities for increasing calcium, especially calcium from milk, protein, and vitamins. So we have what we consider the most high density product that we can have in a small proportion. So we can add also probiotics that we will see today that will have a lot of properties in defenses, especially in gut and immune metabolism and, and many other opportunities and trying to be part of our defenses against uh, intestinal diseases and also, uh, also for in, uh, respiratory diseases. But in perspective, we also have many uh, properties that are associated with yogurt based on gastrointestinal disease, dental health disease, cardiovascular diseases, allergies, and also in the, the metabolic programs that we have as an outcome. Uh, many of the analyses that you see in meta-analysis that you see during these following presentations will show the effect on hypertension, in thief's health, and especially on blood lipids, on cardiovascular risks, and especially on the effects on microbiota and in health in children and human health. But as a whole, we have to understand that the patterns of consumption around the world are very, very different. And even in the States, that's considered the probably the country where, where we have the most important amount of dairy consumption, yogurt is very, very low consumed. And it's exactly the same number that we have in Brazil, only 
6% of the population consumed it every day, very differently from France, when almost all the population consumes at least one portion a day, and some of them uh, consume it almost five servings a day or a week. Uh, usually when we see what are the patterns of consumption of yogurt in, in populations, we see the higher consumption is related to people who are healthier, leaner, higher educated, mostly women, and from higher uh, socioeconomic levels. Uh, this is a product that you see also today at the end of the presentations that is suitable for our meals and uh, we call this a meal and uh, a product that can fill some of the lost opportunities in infant and adult nutrition. It's suitable for breakfast, for snacks, for a whole milk and for dessert. And we will have some uh, experiences at the end of this day so you can have a taste of all of this. But why we call this product a window for lost opportunities in, in human feeding? First of all, because it's a source of protein of high bioavailability, and also we can concentrate protein, so we can make it creamy, we can make it more thicker, uh, much very, very similar from our original products that we have in the Caucasus area in the beginning of human history. It's a very important source of calcium. Some of our products has almost 500 milligrams of calcium. And it's an important tool for battling the lactose intolerance and also the lactose uh, unknowledge that we have around the world with the movement that we are seeing in some different countries based on some movements that are trying to get food free tendencies like gluten-free, milk-free, and uh, meat-free, and all the free products. So we are getting very close to have food-free movement. It's also a source of many different probiotics. It's also a window of opportunity for adding fruits, especially for children who are not able to, to eat it raw. So we can put fruits and we can put jelly, we can put jams and we can put fibers, we can add minerals. It depends on the deficiencies in our country. We have decided to put uh, yogurt together with iron and vitamin A and zinc because of the inadequacy that we have in our population. But it's also an opportunity to establish healthy lifestyle and healthy breakfast or snacking habits around our population. But if it's so nice, it's uh, so good a product, why we do not drink dairy products? And why not yogurts? Especially because we do not have the habit. Probably the habit that we had in some regions and in part of our history were lost with the development. It's a product that was always considered a product that to be eaten by children and women. It's very difficult for men in developing countries to eat them, especially the modern products. We have very low knowledge of possibilities, advantages, probably some costs, lactose intolerance, cows milk protein allergy, something that we have, but we have also to understand that we love to eat milkshakes, we do drink chocolate milk in the morning, we do eat ice cream, and with these products we do not have lactose intolerance. So we have to go back to our history and see that our founders and our immigrants ate guajada, kefir, and other products that are very similar to sour milk. So yogurt is as a status, is one of the indicators of economic changes around developing countries, is related to younger, healthier, connected people, a product to be wished, and how to modernize the intake for so different countries. Finalizing my presentation, I just want to see some of the cases for yogurt in my country. And in the last 30 years, we have increased the, in, the intake of yogurt almost 700%, and it was considered a product that is a sign of our development. In, in spite of our corruption, it's, we are thriving and we are getting better and yogurt is part of this development in our country. So we are now learning to use that. Even that, 
the product uh, yogurt is consumed by only 6% of our population daily, but as you see, uh, dairy products are consumed daily only 4% of our population. So we have to increase this situation. The whole product is the majority of the products, and if we see the whole product is taken by yogurt, by female sex, people living in the south, the developing area, with normal weight, and with very high family monthly income. When we see the low-fat yogurt, the difference is very, very, very different. So we see that these products are consumed by adults, by females, living in the most developed country, the part of our regions, by obese people in our country, and also, again, with very high level income. And as you see in green, the green, level, the, the green bars are the consume of, especially of yogurt, and you see the very important increase with the increasing of uh, socioeconomic level in our population. So that's why it's a product that the populations who are poor wish to consume because when they have the possibility of using yogurt, they really have some advantages and they feel that they are feeling better in our economic status. And if we compare users against non-users in, in our in a survey that we have developed in a Sao Paulo representative population, we see that the majority of the users of yogurt were non-diabetic, non-hypertense, they had more time of school time, they are, were non-smokers, they were white people, so they are richer, they are younger, and especially female. So we have the opportunity to increase dairy products a day for leading the possibility of preventing, of controlling conditions related to excess weight and obesity and weight management, chronic diseases that you see later. But yogurt could be a very important part of solution for these feeding problems because it's a high density, low lactose product with high protein bioavailability with very interesting matrix nutrient interactions. And as a part of solution, we can increase the amount of calcium absorption of higher nutrients, and also a functional food with probiotics, new probiotics, but we have to remember that we eat yogurt because it's a pleasure. But how to separate yogurt from other dairy products is something that you see during the following presentations. So our hypothesis during this day is that users against non-users will have better or different lifestyles so they can have probably higher frequency of foods with high density of nutrients like fruit and vegetables, lower prevalence of unhealthy behaviors like smoking and alcohol usage, higher levels of physical activities, using prevalence, higher le level of using supplements, difference in morbidity, and maybe in nutritional status. But even if we do not find any results directly related to health, why not having a product one a day? Because it's a wonderful place and it's a rescue of antique pleasures. So we had a long road from Guajada, from Kefir, from Bogor to do the modern yogurt. So this road, we are repeating ourselves because we came from the ancient Turkey to rediscover the modern Greek model. So the history always repeats itself. Thank you very much and thank you for your time.